Well, good afternoon and welcome to the second, I think, event in the Brid Lit uh, Festival. Um, first of all, uh, thanks particularly to Kitson and Trotman, who of course are sponsors of the whole festival, but in particular of this session as well. Lawyers from Beminster say particularly appropriate that they should sponsor uh, this morning. Um, I'm Howard Davis. I'm in my day job uh, chair of uh, the NatWest group, um, but the NatWest group has been run largely from Broad Windsor through the um, lockdown, uh, which doesn't seem to have made much difference to the efficiency of the operation, so uh, that's where it's been based. Um, but obviously the principal person you're here to listen to today is uh, Jonathan Sumption. Um, he's become rather well known in the last 18 months as a result of his views on the lockdown, uh, both the of constitutional dimension of it and the civil liberties dimension of it, and I'm sure we'll come on to that. He was on the Supreme Court uh, for almost seven years from 2012 to 2018. He left just before the famous prerogation case and therefore never wore a spider brooch uh, on <laughs> television. Um, his background is a mix, if you like, of the conventional and the very individual. Uh, he was eaten and Oxford, worked for Keith Joseph, uh, the Mad Monk, in the 1970s, um, became a barrister in 1975, so far uh, so conventional. But throughout his career at the bar, he's had a parallel existence as uh, an historian, has written several books on medieval history, including a long series on the Hundred Years' War uh, between England and France. He's published four volumes, and the fifth is about to emerge, and I'm on tenterhooks uh, because I still don't know who won. <laughs> um, but I think it may well be, given recent events, uh, that having finished that war with France, there'll be another one starting soon, um, which provide you with material for the next five volumes. Uh, he has many cultural interests as well, has been on the board of the English National Opera and the Royal Academy of Music, where in fact uh, for a couple of years we served together as uh, trustees on the Royal Academy. Um, he's also unusual in that he went direct from the bar to the Supreme Court without passing through Crown Courts and other apprenticeship judging. Um, I won't list his many high profile cases, but I think his last one before becoming a Supreme Court judge was defending Roman Abramovich against Boris Berezovsky. And more recently, since leaving the Supreme Court, he's become rather a high-profile public figure. He delivered the Wreath Lectures a couple of years ago, has written many articles and been on many broadcasts about COVID, and now has written a new, well, assembled a new collection of his lectures called Law in a Time of crisis, which is, uh, I can tell you, a fascinating book. Uh, there is stuff on COVID, as you might expect. There's something on Brexit. There's something on statues. Uh, there's something on Magna Carta and uh, civil liberties, uh, Scottish uh, independence, gender diversity in the judiciary, judicial review, the British Constitution, personal injury compensation, and all that for £16.99, which... Um, <laughs> has got to be a bargain. Now, you will have questions on some of these topics, and so how I propose to proceed is that I will ask some uh, easy questions uh, to allow Jonathan to get some runs on the board, um, and then we'll open it up uh, to you. Um, and then you will all rush uh, to the counter to buy the book. Now, as I said, we've come on to COVID, but given the events of the last week, um, I want to start with the constitution, parliamentary accountability uh, and all that. And obviously uh, your lecture on this subject in the book was written before the Owen Paterson uh, affair, but you do talk about ideas to restrict judicial review, a different question but nonetheless which has some commonality with uh, the desire to reduce parliamentary accountability. Um, and, of course, you refer in the book to the Attorney-General's call for a political element in the appointment of judges, uh, 
Uh, you throw in controls over the BBC, the treatment of John Burkow, who's not in the Lords, while it seems that Erin Patterson may well be, and you conclude that all these are symptoms of a frame of mind uncomfortable with dissent, which is strong stuff. Is that really an appropriate verdict on our Prime Minister? Um, well, I think the Prime Minister has gone through a number of different phases. Uh, the phase that I had in mind when I wrote that uh, was the phase when uh, his uh, public voice was very largely a voiceover from Dominic Cummings. Um, Cummings is a, 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 a centralising, frustrated autocrat and uh, undoubtedly had a contempt for uh, MPs, uh, born partly of their resistance to Brexit, but not entirely based on that. Um, he described them as pond life. And I think that he represented a genuinely sinister development in uh, British constitutional practice. But since his departure, I think things have got somewhat better. Um, and uh, in particular, we no longer have statements emerging from unnamed but readily identifiable people in Downing Street that read a bit like the sort of press releases that Al Capone might have issued. <laughs> um, that's undoubtedly an improvement. But the Patterson business, perhaps that marks a, a reversion to type, a feeling that uh, MPs are there to do the Prime Minister's bidding. But the big lesson of the Patterson affair is actually quite an optimistic one. Of course, uh, John Major was absolutely right in the criticisms that he made of the Prime Minister's behaviour of her own Patterson. But the system has defeated him. Uh, I think what it shows is the resilience of, of British politics. MPs do not simply troop into the lobby uh, as they're told. Uh, many abstained, 22 voted uh, from the Whip's point of view, the wrong way. And you do not eat humble pie on the scale on which the government has eaten it in the last few days unless you are faced with overpowering pressure, which I'm sure came mainly from people who did comply with the three-line Whip, uh, but resented being made to do so on an issue of this sort. So in a sense, the political system has had its revenge on the Prime Minister. And to my mind, that's something that we should applaud. But in the meantime, the Standards Commissioner has been invited to consider her position. The government still plans to change the committee um, which oversees complaints against members of parliament. Uh, there's been no apology for doing the, accepting this money and lobbying on the basis. I'm, I'm surprised you take such an optimistic view. Well, uh, I think that I mean, the, 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 the corruption allegations against Owen Patterson are one issue. Uh, it's an important issue, but it's not the same as the issue about uh, how governments should behave and when MPs should be whipped in disciplinary matters. I mean, my own view is that, the, uh, uh, that a lot of injustices have been committed uh, over the disciplinary system in both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. I'm not making any comment on Owen Patterson's claims. Um, at the moment, I think that would be completely inappropriate. But there has been a, a history of decisions in the disciplinary committees of both Houses of Parliament in which members of those Houses have been treated very summarily. Uh, their defence evidence has not been properly heard, and I think that's very unfortunate. So I am not an opponent of the idea of having an appeal process, which is essentially the criticism that's been made of the current system. It doesn't have an appeal process, and I think there ought to be one. But that's completely different from the Patterson issue itself. I think that, uh, I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg has said it was a mistake uh, to conflate the uh, Patterson issue with the more general issue about how things should be conducted. It seems to me that Patterson should have been dealt with under the system as it actually existed, rather than retrospectively trying to change it for his case. Uh, and I think that's now acknowledged by just about everybody. Well, probably the, uh, the somewhat bigger uh, issue um, which you do write about in your book is the future of judicial review and uh, how that can be uh, constrained. The government have made it clear that they believe that judicial review is used far too often to question political judgments. And there is at the moment uh, 
a judicial review and courts bill um, going through Parliament. And the Attorney General, Suella Braverman, has uh, su suggested that she plans to invite Parliament to legislate to overturn individual court decisions. Um, what's your view on that? Well, um, uh, the government uh, has changed its position quite significantly uh, since the inflammatory page 50 of the Conservative Party manifesto on which it fought the last general election. Um, uh, uh, in fact, both the courts and the government have changed their positions to quite a significant degree, and I don't think this is always appreciated. The, the bill that's currently going through Parliament represents a very watered-down version uh, of the, uh, the raw meat approach adopted in the Conservative manifesto. Uh, it essentially um, reverses a decision called Privacy International by the Supreme Court, which I'm glad to see reversed because I was party to the decision and dissented. Um, <laughs> but uh, that decision was, uh, it was the, the decision was basically that you could not exclude uh, a right of appeal even from another court. I mean, that's nothing to do with, uh, with protecting ministers, it's protecting courts against um, rights of appeal. There are a number of contexts in which no right of appeal exists and that seems to me to be a decision that Parliament is entitled to make. Uh, essentially the, the current bill does nothing about which one should be terribly concerned. Um, under Robert Buckland, Lord Chancellor for the last 18 months, uh, I think the government has moved in a much more sensible and moderate direction and some of the inflammatory rhetoric uh, has been toned down or disappeared altogether. I think you also needs to recognise that the, the Supreme Court itself has changed its position, and I don't think it's true to say that it's changed it under threat from the government. Uh, what has happened is that uh, after the Human Rights Act came into force, um, this was a new toy with which many judges were very excited. It potentially gave them uh, much greater power, which some of them, I think, were far too keen to use. The problem about judicial review is that there are a number of different contexts in which it arises. If the government does something that it's got no power to do, it's absolutely right that the courts should be in a position to strike down their acts. But there is another category uh, of cases in which the government unquestionably does have power to do whatever it is, uh, but the courts object to uh, the substance of the decision. And many of those cases, not all of them, but many of them, are cases in which the courts have assumed jurisdiction uh, over governmental decisions for which ministers are properly answerable to Parliament. Uh, and this cuts across lines of political responsibility that seem to me to be a very valuable part of our Constitution. Now, what is significant in the current year is that in two major cases, the Supreme Court has stood back and declined to intervene, specifically because they raised issues which were properly a matter for political rather than legal uh, accountability. And I think that is a very healthy development. One of them is the case about Shamima Begum. Uh, I have considerable sympathy with her physician because she has been refused um, uh, uh, access. She's had her UK citizenship revoked in circumstances where she has only the most theoretical kind of citizenship of any other country. And I think that that is uh, an abuse. Uh, but her problem was that she was not physically in the United Kingdom. And so she had great difficulty invoking uh, the Human Rights Convention as a basis for getting back in because basically the convention doesn't apply to immigration decisions of people who are not yet inside the country. Um, so I've got some sympathy for her position, but uh, what I find striking was that the decision of the Supreme Court on that, basically they declined to intervene in a decision whether to allow her into the country on the basis that this was an issue on which the Home Secretary ought to be politically accountable. Uh, and intervention by the judiciary would simply involve them giving effect to their own 
uh, political preferences. I personally think, as I've said, that um, she has, uh, she's entitled to a good deal of sympathy, but that is not a view that I take as a lawyer. It's a view that I take just looking at her situation. I don't think that it is the function of someone acting judicially um, uh, to, to be guided by such considerations. That is the function of politicians. A more recent decision in July, uh, uh, in a case brought by the Child Poverty Action Group, uh, basically put the lid on repeated attempts to use the courts to circumvent um, uh, political decisions about the level of social security payments. Now, there's a respectable case for saying that social security payments should be more generous. Uh, there's a respectable case for saying uh, that um, the um, system which penalizes large families requires rather more justification than it's received politically, and I see that point entirely. But ultimately, I think that we elect people to Parliament to make that decision uh, and to place it in the hands of judges, particularly in an issue which involves large amounts of public expenditure, is completely wrong. So that the decision of the Supreme Court in July, that this was not a matter which the courts should intervene, precisely because what makes us a democracy is that ministers are answerable for that kind of decision, politically, to Parliament, to elected representatives. I think that was an extremely healthy development. This has come about not because of government threats. It's essentially come about because of a generational change in the judiciary, and particularly in the Supreme Court. There have been a large number of departures, I'm not going to name names, from the Supreme Court in the last two or three years of, of people who were very high profile antagonists of the government, not on political grounds, but they simply were far too suspicious of governmental decisions and far uh, uh, not nearly confident enough in the resilience of the political process. So I wholeheartedly applaud the direction in which both the government and the courts have moved, and I think we may be close to the situation where they can learn to get on with each other. But I'm, I'm, I'm slightly struggling to reconcile that with another thing that you say in your book, where you quote Lord Hailsham's reference to how the, we live in the UK in an elective dictatorship. Yes. And you say that wasn't justified in his day, but may shortly be in ours. Yes. Well, that lecture, remember, was delivered in 2019 at the high point of the government's campaign against the courts um, uh, and at the high point of the constitutional crisis over Brexit. The point that I've just been making is that I think we need to recognise that things have to some extent moved on and they moved on in directions which I think are admirable. I'm not for the moment suggesting that everything in the garden is lovely. It certainly isn't. But it's a good deal less ugly than it was two years ago. Okay. Well, now let's move on to COVID, so I must put a mask on to ask uh, these questions. <laughs> um, you've made a, a lot of uh, criticisms of uh, the government's approach on... COVID, uh, some of them well set out in the book about the way in which the government took uh, extreme powers and indeed in some cases acted before they got the powers, um, which is a matter of a few days probably. Um, and so a lot of criticism of the mechanisms of parliamentary um, a a a approval. Uh, but at the end, you say, um, the use of political power as an instrument of coercion is corrosive and that the British people has not even begun to understand the seriousness of what is happening to our country. It marks a move to a more authoritarian form of politics, a fundamental change in our relations with each other, a change characterised by distrust, resentment and mutual hostility. That seems quite an extreme comment on the requirement to wear a mask. I wasn't talking about a requirement to wear a mask, and it would be an extreme comment if I was talking about that. I don't get exercised about masks at all. I, I, I find them inconvenient, but the, it's rational to suppose that they have some uh, impact, and I'm not troubled about that. Uh, what concerns me uh, is essentially the lockdown and the forcible closure 
of hundreds of thousands of businesses, in some cases personally. Permanently. Um, that's, that seems to me to... I mean, all uh, laws potentially limit people's freedom of action. So one isn't talking about rules like drive on the left. Um, uh, one isn't talking uh, about uh, laws that say you shouldn't be polluting rivers with industrial waste and that sort of thing. What we are talking about is the uh, temporary suspension, well, for a long time in fact, of very fundamental rights like the right uh, to run a business whether or not the government regards it as necessary or essential, the right to move outside your front door, the right to engage in social exchanges with other human beings, which I regard as fundamental to our humanity. Uh, I do not think uh, that liberty is an absolute value, but I think that it is the foundation of human happiness and creativity, and I think it is therefore a very, very high value indeed. Um, uh, if we were talking about an epidemic of Ebola with a case fatality rate of 50%, or an outbreak of smallpox, 30%, I could see the point of this. What we are actually dealing with is a health crisis which, although serious, is well within the range of um, the clinical misfortunes that humanity has had to live with for many, many centuries. It is not the most serious epidemic uh, in recent times. Spanish flu was very much worse, uh, and uh, the combined two epidemics in the 50s and 60s of Hong Kong and Asian flu flu were uh, not as bad, but not much, not, there wasn't much difference. The case fatality rate is about the same. The uh, uh, infectivity of COVID was greater. So we are dealing with something which is within the range of human experience. My criticism of the government's action was, first of all, that they failed to make use of the one aspect of the COVID pandemic which made it much easier to deal with than previous pandemics of the sort, namely the fact that it was highly selective in its incidence. It essentially attacked, with very few exceptions, uh, the old uh, and people with underlying clinical vulnerabilities. Uh, a policy which sought to shelter them rather than indiscriminately close down the life of the nation uh, would have been a much more uh, sensible approach. My second criticism was that at no point did the government, uh, at the, well, when I say at no point, at the outset, the government never took into account the economic, social, or other medical consequences. They didn't look at the collateral consequences at all. And the reason for that was perfectly simple. Nobody had contemplated, even for a moment, the possibility of a, of a total lockdown um, as a response to a, a health problem of this sort. Um, the best evidence of that is the European Centre for Disease Control, which was set up after the uh, SARS epidemic, which didn't actually materialise in Europe in the early years of this century. They coordinated the 28 national plans for the full range of measures that might be taken in the event of a serious pandemic. In early February 2020, uh, uh, i.e. just three weeks before the European lockdowns began. They published the results of this review. Uh, it's interesting to notice how many of the 28 countries that had national plans contemplated even the possibility of a lockdown. The answer to that question is none. Not a single one of the 28 nations whose uh, plans were coordinated envisaged such a thing. The Robert Koch Institute in Germany, which was responsible for their official plan, took the same view as SAGE did uh, in January and February of 2020, uh, that this was absolutely unthinkable um, and indeed unnecessary. Ten years of planning had gone in to pandemic preparation in this country, which has been, uh, pandemics have been top of the National Risk Register since it was first published in 2008. At no stage was it suggested that such a thing should be contemplated, uh, and indeed it was expressly rejected. If you look at the SAGE minutes leading up to the decision on the 23rd of March to impose the lockdown, at no point do we find this being actually recommended. This was a panic reaction which was generated primarily by the fact that other countries, starting with Italy, had, had done this. 
uh, and it was therefore thought to be politically acceptable. Um, Thomas Hobbes is a very instructive thinker on this. He was a 17th century apologist for absolute government. And his argument was actually basically very simple, although it takes a whole book, Leviathan, to explain it. It's one of the great masterpieces in the English language. Hobbes said, the implicit bargain uh, which people make with the state is uh, that the state gives them security and in return people abandon their entire right to any kind of liberty irrevocably. That was Hobbes' view. Now, I hope that most people in this country would regard that conclusion uh, as repellent, uh, but it is the principle on which we have been living for much of the last two years. But what I was surprised about, um, uh, I mean, I understand the civil liberties arguments, and indeed, um, the way in which we have handled this is, is not obviously very good. I mean, if you look at countries, if you plot excess deaths on one axis and economic damage on the other, if you look, say, France versus America, the French have got fewer excess deaths and more economic damage. The Americans, less economic damage, more excess deaths. Mm -hmm. You can see that trade-off. We have, in relation to France, um, more economic damage and more excess deaths. Mm -hmm. So whatever we've done, we haven't done it terribly well. But the bit that I was surprised about particularly was your point that <clears throat> the consequence of this will be a fundamental change in our relations with each other, a change characterised by distrust, resentment and mutual hostility. Now, yes. you know, we may, if this conversation goes on long enough, generate a bit of mutual hostility, but no, is that like really it. the case yes, uh, collectively is. in society? I don't observe it. I, I do. Uh, every time that you saw large numbers of young people crowding on Westminster Bridge or going down to beaches on the south coast, uh, you had uh, a tremendous hue and cry, uh, uh, the cry of covid idiots and so on. Uh, to my mind, these were people who were relatively invulnerable themselves. They were all of an age where the likelihood of hospitalisation or death was, was, was very small. Uh, and what you saw was passionate hostility in some quarters uh, to, to this. What, is, what this kind of uh, these measures breed is a feeling uh, that uh, what we need is a national solidarity uh, and therefore a considerable intolerance of people who step out of line. Now, solidarity can take two different forms. There is the solidarity of mutual assistance and sympathy, which was very much in evidence uh, for much of the COVID crisis, uh, and which I have no problem with. And there is the solidarity of intolerant conformism, which is what I was talking about in that paragraph. Mm. I'm going to come to um, the audience in just a moment, but let me just um, raise uh, one other point. Um, just to broaden the conversation a bit, because your book is not entirely about COVID or the Constitution, lots of, uh, lots of interesting other stuff. Um, so I hope you're thinking of your questions, but let me just raise one other one, and that's um, the uh, exciting culture wars issue, and particularly um, the uh, toppling of, of statues. Uh, and you refer to the Colston uh, affair in Bristol, and say, talk about the, 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 the anger which seeks to remove memorials of the past because the past did not share the values of the present. This is an irrational and absurd thing to do. So the people toppling Colston and Cass were irrational and absurd. Yes, in my view they were. Uh, I, I have no hesitation about that. Uh, all human life involves light and shade. Uh, there are hardly any societies and very few individuals who can claim that they have only done good or for that matter only done bad. Uh, Colston is a classic example. Um, Colston was a not a particularly big shareholder but a shareholder in the Royal Africa Company which at the time he invested in it had a monopoly of the English based slave trade. Um, but there were many other aspects to his life, and one of them is that he was an enormous benefactor of the city of Bristol, who uh, devoted his fortune to creating hospitals and schools 
and public institutions. The statue that was erected uh, to him, in fact, at the end of the 19th century, uh, was erected to honor his philanthropic activities. It had nothing to do with slavery. Uh, I do not accept the view uh, that because somebody has done something which um, is bad, you have a duty to ignore everything that he has done which is good. Because it seems to me that that is, first of all, it's a fundamentally Philistine attitude. Secondly, it's an ahistorical attitude because it fails to accept that all human life is a mixture uh, of, of, of good and bad. Uh, and it is not a principle that can be carried more than a very short distance. Uh, the Western civilization is largely founded on values which originate in the classical world. The worlds of Greece and Rome were entirely founded on slavery. That's what made the lives of the classical uh, civilizations possible in the way that they happened. Um, it, it, England in the 18th century uh, was a society which all benefited in one way or another uh, from slavery. Um, slavery was always to some extent controversial but was regarded as basically <coughs> acceptable for most of human history. Uh, I think that those who criticise in particular Britain for its legacy of slavery are ignoring the fact that Britain was also the first slaving country to abolish first the trade and then slavery itself, that the Royal Navy had a prominent role in suppressing uh, the slave trade of other countries during the 19th century. This is a classic illustration of the fact that humanity can, has bad and good moments uh, and that we have to recognize uh, that both of them are important. And to suppress whole aspects of one's history because of one aspect of them uh, seems to me to be completely ridiculous. I, it's... <laughs> The, the difficulty I guess I have is where you draw the line here, because if we look at other statues that have been toppled um, in, our, in our lifetimes, um, let's take a couple of examples. There was a huge statue of Stalin that towered over Budapest, toppled. Should that have stayed up? Well, Saddam Hussein in, in Baghdad, should that have stayed up? He did lots of good things. I mean, the economy was fine. Yes, I mean, I think that people who... Uh, erect statues to themselves, perhaps belong in a different category. <laughs> um, and in addition, the, in, in the case of the Eastern European statues to uh, the benign uh, Russian soldiery that invaded them in 1944 and 1945, these were actually symbols of an alien power that had invaded these countries and effectively taken their political systems over. Uh, that seems to me to give rise to very different considerations. If this country had been successfully invaded by Germany in 1940 uh, and large numbers of statues uh, of uh, um, uh, German generals had appeared dotted around the streets of London, I do not doubt that they would have been removed after the war, and rightly so. What we are talking about is people who have had statues erected to honour those things in their lives which have done great good to their communities. And those are things which they deserve to be honoured for, even if there were other aspects of their lives uh, which one does not admire. Thank you. Let me turn it to the uh, audience, as I've talked uh, enough. I can't actually see anybody particularly, but I gather there are... Ah, there we go. Um, I gather there are um, roving microphones, so if anyone would like to put their hand up, then um, I can... There we are. Great. If you could give your name and then launch in. Thank you. Yeah, my name's Colin Bryce. I, I was interested in the statement you mentioned that some judges were very enthusiastic about taking on the government. Um, about 20 years ago I lived in the, the States at the time there was a confirmation hearing for a Supreme Court judge and in a typical British... Like Clarence Thomas. I can't remember who it was now but I had a slightly condescending attitude to it. It seemed a completely inappropriate version and I felt we had a better way of selecting judges. I've kind of changed my mind given that you know, the, the, the pro-regression case and, and, and some of the judicial reviews and the sort of opaque way we 
select judges. Do you think it's time we, we did have a more politicised process for the selection of judges so we at least understood where they were coming from when they were making some of those decisions? No, I don't. And I think that the American experience illustrates most of the reasons why that would be a thoroughly bad idea. Um, ever since the confirmation hearings for Robert Bork at the end of the 1970s, there has been a, a set form of these confirmation hearings, um, leaving aside cases where there's an allegation of scandalous behaviour in the past. Um, but uh, basically, uh, what all candidates now say is, I can't answer the question how I would decide this or that case, because it would depend on the arguments that I would be listening to before making the decision. Uh, that is the constitutionally correct answer. It's a completely uninformative answer. Uh, and so the first reason why political confirmation hearings would be a bad idea is that they're completely useless. Uh, the second reason why they're a bad idea is that what they aim to do is to establish uh, that, a, um, uh, that the candidate is, so to speak, politically acceptable. Now, the problem about that is that uh, we do not have a government which can count on remaining in power indefinitely, mercifully. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, how would the uh, uh, present government have felt uh, if during the 13 years that the Labour Party had been in power, substantial Labour majorities in the House of Commons had ensured that only radical left-wing judges were appointed, would one uh, have a system under which you had a clear-out of judges every time that the party complexion in the House of Commons changed? Uh, I think that this is a completely deplorable idea. Moreover, I think that the decisions of the courts in areas where they intrude, in my view, unacceptably into political decisions, are not actually, um, they're not political in the sense that they spring from um, party sympathies of the judges, uh, or even, you mentioned the prorogation case, and I'll say something about that in a moment, uh, or even, uh, 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 I mean, essentially, there is a judicial attitude which is unduly suspicious of government and has no confidence in the ability of parliament to hold government to account. Uh, I, have, I, don't, I think the system is imperfect, but it's better and has better democratic legitimacy than any alternative system. Um, you mentioned the prorogation case. I think that's a very good example. Um, I believe that the prorogation case was absolutely right, although I have for many years been a critic of political interventions by the judiciary. The reason why it was right is that what the government sought to do was to exercise a public power, which is what the right of prorogation is, in a way where they would be responsible to absolutely nobody at all. They wouldn't be responsible to Parliament because it would be prorogued, if they'd won, they wouldn't have been responsible to the courts because the whole issue was non-justiciable. They're not responsible to the electorate because, except at general elections, the electorate has no institutional means of calling the government to account. So what you would have is a public power exercisable by the Prime Minister in circumstances where he was not accountable to anyone at all. That is to turn a public power into essentially a, a private privilege of a particular minister. And the common law has always taken the view uh, that you cannot have a public power for which there is no public accountability. If the government had won that case, there would have been no public accountability for a major exercise uh, of public power. And I think that that would have been very unfortunate. Yeah, there's one down here, and then I've got another one over there. So let's take this one. Get, just wait for the just wait for the microphone, because oh, otherwise sorry. people can't uh, can't hear you. Thanks. Um, uh, referring to the uh, uh, now notorious uh, debate over the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, one of the issues which has arisen is the role of the European Court, and uh, not to be confused with the European Court of Human Rights, but the European Court. Uh, as part of the European Union. Yep. Um, 
the Lord Frost has made it uh, very emphatic in saying that uh, under no circumstances could the government accept, uh, the United Kingdom government could accept uh, jurisdiction of a European court in matters relating to uh, the trade arrangements uh, between uh, uh, the um, United Kingdom and, uh, and Northern Ireland. Uh, what is your view on that uh, issue, uh, bearing in mind that, of course, the agreement which our eminent Prime Minister signed uh, very much uh, accepted that the Nor Northern Ireland would be part of the single market and the customs union? But I'd be very interested in your thoughts on, on that. Well, your question raises two separate issues, and I think it's important to keep them separate. One is the question whether you honour treaties that you have made, to which it seems to me that the only acceptable answer is that you do honour them. Um, I think that whether you think that the agreement made in January uh, 2020 uh, by the present Prime Minister was a sensible agreement or not is another issue. Now, uh, what do I think about that? No, I don't think it was a sensible agreement uh, for a number of reasons. But um, uh, one of them was certainly the position of the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice is a, uh, a very directional court. It, has, it is a, a strongly ideological court. It has always regarded it as its function, and historically this was a large part of its purpose, uh, to achieve uh, a degree of homogeneity within the European Union uh, and to achieve the objects of the treaty, one of which is ever closer union. Now, it seems to me that that is a decision which, obviously, those who wish to belong to the European Union are entitled to take. But I think that the conferring of jurisdiction on the European Court over relations between the um, European Union and third countries, such as we have now become, is, in principle, uh, a very bad idea both because it involves the courts of one party to a dispute uh, adjudicating on uh, the dispute against uh, another outsider, and because the particular characteristics of the Luxembourg court uh, mean that it has an inherent bias in favour of that which will serve the interests, of, uh, 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 the interests in political unity of the European Union. Now, I... Uh, I was a Remainer, and I would, if the referendum were held again today, which of course is not conceivable, I would uh, take exactly the same view now. Uh, but I think that if you do decide to leave the EU, the logic of that is that you cannot accept jurisdiction being given uh, to, the, uh, to the Luxembourg court. So if the Prime Minister hadn't sold the pass on that in January 2020, uh, I would have considerable sympathy with what Lord Frost said. Unfortunately, it seems to me to be two years too late to say it. Uh, the second qu question are just over there, second row. Thank you. Hello, Lord Sumption. I'm very happy to have you here tonight because I've been following you for, um, I think, the last year and a half on YouTube okay. about your views about COVID. Um, uh, I have my reservations about the constant renewal of the pandemic laws, which um, I, coming from Germany and having studied history and even taught history, remind me in some um, quite sinister way of the Enablement Act of 19, nine, uh, 1933. Um, do you see any parallels there? Because the pandemic laws seem to be um, extended automatically, almost open, automatically, without any vote. They seem to be just signed off, you know. It's just like, oh, we go for six months again and nobody even gives a toss about it, which I find quite shocking. Well, uh, the, the short answer to your question is that I don't see a parallel. It is a question of degree, but it's a very extreme question of degree. The Enabling Act of 1933 authorised the Hitler government to legislate on every subject without restriction. Um, and it used that power to achieve the 
degree of control over German society which we all know about. Um, uh, this is uh, much more specific. Uh, there is also, if I may say so, I think a misconception underlying your question. Uh, most people seem to think that the uh, Coronavirus Act, which needs to be renewed every six months, uh, is the basis on which these restrictions have been imposed. It actually isn't. Um, the Coronavirus Act uh, gives relatively minor powers, which haven't in fact been used in relation to some aspects of the health crisis. But it's actually a, an act which is mainly concerned with um, authorising a higher level of government expenditure and a government expenditure without the degree of con parliamentary control, which has been a feature of the Constitution for a long time. I mean, I have misgivings about the Coronavirus Act on that ground, but most people who uh, uh, complain about the renewal of the Coronavirus Act are under the impression that it's the basis on which the lockdowns and the closures of businesses, etc., have been conducted. It isn't. They've all been done under the Public Health Act, which has been in force since 1984 and was amended in 2008 to confer most of the powers that have currently been exercised. Uh, I think that uh, it was unfortunate that the government chose to use that act because it requires a very limited measure of parliamentary oversight. Uh, and I think that the courts were unduly craven to accept in the Dolan case, that they were entitled to use the Public Health Act. They were absolutely, as a matter of law, they did have the power to, uh, uh, to impose these decisions. I don't think they were wise decisions, but I think they had the power to do it. But they had the power to use it under, do it under the Civil Contingencies Act. And there's an important difference, because the Civil Contingencies Act requires a renewed parliamentary consent to these kind of measures every 30 days. It involves a very high level of parliamentary supervision. And I think that the evasion of parliamentary supervision uh, is uh, one of the more scandalous features of the way that the government has conducted this. Now, I think, therefore, that your point uh, is, uh, is, is, is justified. It, it, the general tenor of your question is that governments should not have the power without a high degree of legislative supervision to do this kind of thing. And, while I don't accept that the parallel with Hitler is at all close, uh, I do think that you are right to identify this as a serious problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's somebody uh, at the back here. I can't really see the cheap seats at, in the balcony, um, <laughs> but if you, if you wave furiously, perhaps I can. But there's another one here, I think. And I'm hoping to ask a broader question about uh, the connection between democracy and the rule of law, because uh, you're currently a non-permanent judge uh, at the Hong Kong Final Court of Appeal, and your reason for not leaving that position is that Britain's greatest legacy to Hong Kong is not democracy, but the rule of law. But I just wonder whether, like, don't you think those two are connected? Because if there's an unjust law, which, you know, like, there's no way to overturn, then aren't judges, um, you know, aren't they only a part of that unjust uh, operation? Well, um, uh, I do not think that, demo I think you can have an illiberal democracy. I, I think you can have a democracy that is not characterized by the rule of law. I wouldn't like to live in such a, a democracy, but I think that it can exist. These are, I think there is an overlap, but uh, they are actually uh, distinct concepts. Hong Kong gives rise to rather special considerations. Hong Kong has never had a democracy. The British uh, had a uh, hundred years in which to introduce democracy and never did. Even during the 1960s, when the British uh, introduced legislatures, democratic legislatures in virtually all their colonies before independence. They never did that in Hong Kong. Uh, that was an opportunity missed, uh, and ultimately, when they agreed the joint declaration, which is the treaty with China, they had to give that point away. There's an aspirational uh, clause in that agreement which says that the ultimate objective is some form of democracy, but the cards were left entirely in the hands of China. Now, the position of the Court of Final Appeal uh, is that, uh, okay, the rule of law still does apply, but that is obviously a point at which uh, a judge 
is entitled to say, okay, the rule of law applies in this place, but the content of the laws is so repellent that I simply don't want to be a part uh, of their administration. Uh, I don't believe that Hong Kong has reached that stage yet. None of the cases in which people have been successfully prosecuted for sedition have yet reached the appellate courts. I think a lot will depend on what happens when they do reach the appellate courts. Um, but at the moment, uh, I take the view uh, that the only uh, that, that uh, the only ground on which it would be right for British judges to withdraw from the Court of Final Appeal was if they were doing more harm than good by staying there. The only consideration that weighs in my mind is the interests of the people of Hong Kong. What I am absolutely adamant about is that it is not the function of judges to engage in political demonstrations, whatever they may think uh, about the policy of the relevant government. And the view, those who wish the British judges to withdraw from the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong are essentially asking the judges to mark their disapproval of the Chinese government's suppression of democracy by staging a political demonstration. I don't believe that that would do the slightest good to the people of Hong Kong uh, and because I think that their interests are paramount in any decision I make as a judge of the Hong Kong court, that is the view that I propose to persist in until the situation changes significantly. We've got time for one or maybe two more before we, before we wind up. And there's, uh, yeah, I can see another one. Okay. Yes, okay, uh, go for it. Crispin Weston. Um, I'm interested that you are a Remainer on the basis that it seems to me that the European Union has done a lot um, to encourage the sort of judicial activism uh, that you've criticised and undermined the political processes. I was particularly interested in your wreath lectures on your comments on referendums. You were against them on the basis that they were very divisive, which I agree with. Um, but they may perhaps be the last resort. Um, I also wanted to raise the question of the Enabling Act, not on the basis of any comparison with Hitler, but on, on, the, on the central paradox that you had a properly constituted democratic body which effectively abolished democracy. Is there not some paradox? Which body are you talking about? Uh, the, the Reichstag. Oh, I see. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, is there not some parallel with the British Parliament uh, surrendering sovereignty to uh, effectively undemocratic uh, European ins uh, institutions? No, I don't think there is. And I'll tell you why. I think there is a world of difference between uh, sharing sovereignty and surrendering it. Uh, essentially, what we did in 1972 when Parliament authorised uh, joining the European Economic Community, as it was then called, what we did was not noticeably dissimilar from what the 13 states of the United States did in joining together in a single state under the same constitution in 1787. Um, uh, I, I, it seems to me that um, the European Union has ve many very unattractive features, uh, including the ones that you mention. The one of the problems, though, about the whole Brexit debate is that people would say to themselves, the European Union has done wonderful things, therefore we should join uh, or remain in, or the European Union has done terrible things, therefore we should leave. Both of these approaches seem to me to be completely wrong-headed because there are good and bad things about the European Union and you simply have to weigh up uh, which is the stronger consideration. I have never subscribed to the view that the 52% who voted to leave the EU did so out of xenophobia. I've never accepted that they were deceived. Of course, lies were told, but I don't believe they had any real impact. I've never accepted that this was due to post-imperial nostalgia or any of the other patronizing explanations. I think, it, I think that the referendum result was a, was a, a significant mistake, uh, but I think that it was a, a seriously considered judgment uh, the British are not mad, they are simply mistaken on this one, just as, <laughs> just as many people are on most issues. Um, I, basically, I don't want to deliver this in a lecture on Brexit, but basically there are two 
problems. One is uh, that the economic cost of leaving a market of 500 million people uh, seems, to, uh, the closest market geographically, seems to me to be very high. Uh, secondly, I think that this is actually uh, a departure from five centuries of intelligent foreign policy on the part of Britain. Um, because the whole tenor of British policy towards Europe for centuries has been uh, to avoid a single power being dominant in the whole continent of Europe. It's always had a policy of involving itself in alliances with the rest of Europe. The consequence of our leaving the European Union has been that the tendencies to, uniform, to, to union in the European Union will accelerate because we will no longer be the principal opponent of that. Um, and the result is we will be faced with a solid block of territory of which we will not form part, which may act in a way that's very adverse to our interests. This seems to me to be a betrayal of the way that the United Kingdom has successfully protected its interests for very many years, and I think that it's the result of a refusal to weigh up pros and cons. People only think of the considerations uh, uh, one way or the other without ever deciding which is the lesser evil. Thank you. We're going to wind up uh, now because we've reached our hour. I'm going to ask for one favour from you, which is that um, Jonathan needs to make his way out there and to the stall uh, with his mountain of books. Um, and so if you could hold on for a short period of time while he does that. But um, in the meantime, let me thank you for your questions, which are all very interesting. And thank you particularly for your answers. Um, it has been very illuminating and um, you will enjoy the book. Thank, Thank you. you.